Hey, welcome to Steve McGrath's Base Craft. So um, last week I was talking about the analytics that I was looking at for the podcast and I said that there was some listeners in Thailand and I gave a call out saying, could one of them send me a message? And you know what, one of them did. Uh, Summit sent me a message on Instagram. Hey man, hope you're still listening. And he just said, yeah, he just put in base into like TuneIn app or one of the apps. And this was the first thing podcast that came up. So that's pretty cool. Um, he's actually not even a bass player. He plays guitar. He's studying jazz guitar at the moment. But um, he's really enjoying learning about all these new bass players and especially some of the Irish guys. And he said to check out a band called Katie Chang. They're from Taiwan. And I had a little listen. And yeah, they're really good. And the bass player is unreal. So hopefully she might, if she speaks English, we could get her to come on and chat to us about what's going on over there with the, the bass world. So yeah, that's that's pretty much all my news at the moment. So I'm just going to jump straight in with uh, today's guest, um, Carl Clues. So Carl is my first guest on who is in the world of solo bass. So what Carl does is solo bass transcriptions of pop songs, jazz standards, pretty much anything really. He's been doing it for years now, like six, seven years, I think. And uh, he has hundreds of videos made. Like it's he's he does it every week, which is amazing that he can keep that up. And um, he has a, a nice uh, following on Patreon, which, as we all know, is hard to do because it's actual real money, not just likes and follows. So we had a great chat, and we we talked about how he goes about making these um, transcriptions of songs, and also then we got into talking about his um, endorsement with Bogart basses, which are just class, like um, graphite neck, composite body, all that cool stuff. So um, yeah, let's just jump in. And of course, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And thanks to everyone who sent me the messages. I'm really delighted with the fact that we're building up this cool bass community around the podcast. I even got some emails off you guys for guests to have on, which is great. I really appreciate the help. So. Yeah, it's lovely to see it building up. And um, so, yeah, let's just jump in with Carl and um, see you in a minute. Are you good? I'm good, I think, yeah. Don't yeah. coffee. Good to go. I, I forgot my coffee, but I, uh, I survived, you know. I was a bit, I'm a bit wired today, actually. I have a lot of projects kind of going on at the moment. And yeah, yeah, I, I, get, I see I get you it. putting stuff up all the time. I saw a little collaboration with, with uh, a drummer there. Yeah, that was an today, old one. I, when I started yeah. first on instagram i was like ripping videos of people because no one would collab with me because they're like who's this guy who has no followers <laughs> i'm not sending him any video i don't want that to do with him so i just rip random videos off it and i'd collab with them and without telling them so, right <laughs> yeah, yeah a lot of people are doing it yeah a lot of people are doing it it's, that was it's, fun, it's actually. a good it's a good way to get going you know yeah it was so. good to get going um but i have a lot of other stuff i'm doing a, a video it's out next friday with a polish lad uh he makes beats on reaper and we we're doing a video so yeah doing some fun stuff like i'm not as prolific as you like you you, you seem to have this con if i was to do what you do and try and be as consistent uh the stress would just try i would be able to handle the stress of it like yeah to, to put uh, myself on a schedule like to get so i tried that before and i was just got i was running up the wall just like it's uh, it's near the end of the week and i've done nothing and that video <laughs> takes 12 hours I, I i just won't sleep for two days i'll get this done <laughs> But you see, I, I kind of have the opposite problem. I mean, in, in normal times, that, that's the issue. You know, I've set myself this this task of, of doing some kind of video every week and, and pretty much a manager. But since the lockdown, I have the opposite problem. That I'll, I'll do, I'll put out a video, say, on Monday, and then I'll have another idea, get it done by Friday, and think, oh, I can put this one out now. <laughs> and then I've still got to do another one for Monday. <laughs> so, you know... It's like my mind's working too fast in the pandemic. Yeah. You see what I mean? Hey, that's that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's kind of annoying for some people online. I, I do get the impression sometimes because I post this stuff everywhere. You know, as many forums as I can find, I share it. And every so often, I do think I, I see the odd comment. You say, "Oh, geez, it's not this guy again." <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there any way you can turn up your mic? Can you increase the? Can I increase the level? Yeah. Uh, should we go with that? <laughs> yeah, because I I have a I have a fucking loud voice and. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I I actually do have a very quiet voice. I mean, um, the, the stage, you know, the, the <laughs> stage hands and the, or or the you know the guy on sound whenever they're micing me up. So you could sing a bit louder, and that's as loud as my voice goes. 
Really? You no, know, I, I just, yeah, there's, I don't know, I don't have that air pressure or something into the mic. So yeah, it's... I think I'm yelling, but they're still not getting enough of it. Yeah, it's funny, the, the band, I mean, uh, Crow Black Chicken, our singer, Christy, has like this insanely powerful voice. And we have this yeah. piece of shit PA. We've had it for nearly 10 years. And we gig all over the country. And it's grand. But then, and like, we have the, the gain at zero on the PA. And he's still <laughs> blowing the speakers out of it. And anytime we have a support band, the poor lad singing is like, can you give me more volume? I'm like, no, our PA is terrible. You just need to sing as loud as Christy. <laughs> But yeah, that, it's just your voice, isn't it? Everyone has a different way, more projection, yeah. like you know. Yeah, exactly. I think my my voice. You know, I, I've never had singing lessons, and it's one of those things that I keep meaning to do because because I do kind of harbour ambitions that way at some point. Yeah, uh, I, I do tried try the thing, but no, I, yeah. I'm, I'm giving up now. I, I I wasn't gifted with the voice, any kind of voice, so I wouldn't put it on the world ever again. So. <laughs> But um, you were saying about you were putting up, or oh, you're after disappearing on me. Oh, you froze there for a minute. You're back. You you were saying um <laughs> about putting up stuff and like you get no hop off it. Like, uh, isn't it? It is a bad feeling when you put up something and it's just tumbleweeds, and it it kind of hits you in the gut. Did you find it hard to get over that and just be like, I don't give a shit. I put this up. Yeah. Well, th that's it. I mean, everybody starts out that way. Unless you're lucky enough for your first video to be a, a viral hit, you know. Because um, I really, I'd been putting out videos for a couple of years before anybody really noticed. You know, yeah. I, I think it was that uh, the Pink Panther one um, that uh, kickstarted it because Bootsy Collins, of all people, shared it online. Nice. And, and sudden, suddenly I'd got an audience. You know? <laughs> but before that, I'd just been putting these things out, and really it was just for me, you know. Um, yeah. Because I was making these arrangements and uh, forgetting them, so I thought, well, a good way to to remind myself how these things go. Because I, I hate writing things out. <laughs> you know, I just, yeah. I don't have the patience for that. Although, you know, uh, I I do that now, you know, for an income <laughs> as it happens. Yeah. But but at the beginning, I, I just didn't want to write these things out. So I thought, well, if I just record them, then I, I've got a visual and audio record of what I was doing. So I'll mm. remember. I can pick it up again just by watching the video and then i was running out of space on my computer to store these things <laughs> so i thought well hang on youtube that's what youtube's for it's you know it's it's <laughs> you know unlimited storage space exactly. forever yeah so and no one I ever watches started... them you haven't dared to watch them yourself to <laughs> exactly. them. That, that's it and that that was the idea at first it's okay just, it's it's grown into something else but that... you know you're, you're right that a lot of people get they they um, the lucky thing for me was that I didn't plan on doing this. You know, as I say, my plan was just to store these things there for my own usage. Um, but a lot of people, you know, will upload videos with the intention of this becoming their career, becoming something they can earn an income from, etc. And then, you know, they get very discouraged that after a year or two, there's still no audience there. Yeah. But it just takes time. And I was lucky, I was kind of, I was insulated from that time issue because mm. I wasn't even thinking about it. I wasn't that's looking class. that's the best attitude, that though, that anyone it could was, have. It was, <laughs> it, it, it was lucky, you know, and, and I guess, you know, I got in early, early-ish, mm. you know, not not as early as guys like Davey, 504 and so on. <laughs> um, but, but I kind of beat the big rush, which has come in the last, couple of years mm. you know, especially then. now since lot, the the whole Absolutely, gigs are over yeah. everyone wants to get it online and then yeah there you are <laughs> 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 but but yeah you know it's it's as good a time to start as any because people you've got are like two years more. of practice to do to get learn how to record get the sound yeah, good get the get the video we're not we're musicians not videographers most of us anyway like so yeah yeah well i have to say i love the video side of it you know i i, I really enjoy experimenting with that kind of thing um so i, I didn't think i would again you know because i've always been about the music yeah i think um, yours are great you use a green screen and you're always that's right. it's like where in the world will carl be this <laughs> <laughs> all over the, or what planet will you be on <laughs> yeah I, again it's, it's just to entertain me i don't want every video to look exactly the same i want there to be some kind of visual hook in there and and I often you know, it, it it was a kind of a way for me to see if people were watching till the end. Mm. So on on 
few of my videos. I, I stick a little twist in at the end and see if anybody notices. And uh, <laughs> not many do. <laughs> you know, I, I think people, looking at my stats, I think people watch the first two minutes and they're like, yeah, um, I've got the idea. I get it. But, you know, that's, that's just YouTube attention span. You know? well, how many years have you been doing it now? Uh, I think it's about seven years, to be honest. That's that's a nice la- length, like to, to take. Yeah. To take that just shows the work it takes to get a following, doesn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, that's it. And as I said, for the first two, maybe three years of that, you know, I, I had like a hundred subscribers. Mm. But then, let's say, Bootsy Collins shared a few other, you know, fairly big sites shared a few videos, and and it just, you know, it just spirals from there. And you have a fairly good following now. I noticed you have your Patreon set up, and, and you've a nice few yeah, followers on it, like because yeah. it is very hard because uh, it's money. Like it's not just someone clicking a button. I'm subscribed. People have to lay down the actual hard cash, like to be your uh, yeah, on it. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I've, I've nothing but good things to say about Patreon because again, I, I just, uh, I wasn't expecting anything when I put stuff on there. I just, I just said, well, it's there. I'll, I'll give it a go. You know, um, you know, I the idea was obviously to to give people access to those uh, arrangements that I've made, to give them the transcriptions and backing tracks. You know, if if there was a percussion track, they could have that to play along with it, and also you know to get the MP3 of me playing because some people had asked for that, but mm. you know they, they just wanted to stick it on their, you know, their iPhone, whatever. Um, and uh, so I I started putting a few up there, and I. I just thought, you know, there's only going to be a handful of people sign up for this, and and they'll probably only subscribe for a month or two, get what they want, and disappear. Mm. Fair enough, you know. I appreciated all the savings they did. I do move my own subscriptions around on Patreon. I spread the the bit of cash that I have around, you know. Well, that's it. That's how it works. Yeah, yeah. And um, but but what I was finding was that a lot of the people who are signing up aren't bass players, and aren't even musicians they're just signing up because they want to show some kind of appreciation you know it's, it's like it's like a, a euro or two every month and they're just uh, you know they're happy to, to to pay that just to say thanks for doing what you're doing we enjoy what we do and i I, would, mm. I have to say i've been really kind of moved by that i didn't expect that at all i just thought people just go to the internet because they want something yeah, <laughs> you know and do you have much interaction with them like have chats every month or that kind of thing uh no no I, I, it's something i do mean to get into now i mean there's there's, there's enough subscribers there that, that it would make make that kind of thing worthwhile i mean obviously if you've only got three or four subscribers then, then it feels a bit well i saw um, that kind of thing. Uh, a youtuber that i follow chris chronos he just does covers he lives in malaga or somewhere like that but um he's playing like what's that game among us it's like this video oh, yeah. game yeah. And he goes with the fans. He goes on like a few nights a week and plays a video game with them. I don't know. It's just something fun, I suppose. And they get to know. Yeah, well, it's it's the whole new new economy. It's mm. it's the wild west out there. You know, it's um, yeah. I I listen to a whole bunch of podcasts. There's a guy called Richard Heron, a comedian. I don't know if you remember him from the nineties. No, no. Uh, Lee and Heron was was the, the duo he was in. Stuart Lee and Richard Heron. And uh, Richard now does podcasts pretty much full time. That's what he does. But he was talking to another comedian, um, Lindy, guy from Glasgow. Oh Scottish God, his, his accent really is funny. strong. He, he's brilliant. <laughs> he's he's doing a lot of um, twitching at the moment, isn't he? Game exactly. On that, that's it. Yeah, that's it. He's not really doing the the, the comedy thing. Mm. He, he he goes on Twitch and he plays. What was he saying? Uh, oh, um, like, he's playing Dead uh, Stranding. He's playing a bit of that game. I, th- I think that was kind of uh, some kind of articulated lorry simulator. Oh yeah, <laughs> that he <laughs> plays. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This thick Glaswegian accent. Like, I'm driving yeah. this lorry over <laughs> here. It's like somehow this is entertaining. I've watched it and see. He just gets yeah, sucked yeah. in, and this is what he was saying on the on, on the podcast. He's not a comedian anymore. He's, he's a virtual lorry driver, and he, he's <laughs> loving it. <laughs> a bit healthier than a normal lorry driver. He's still getting, getting a few yeah. steps in. Get... <laughs> but um, well, I definitely want to get around to like how you because I've tried to learn some of your songs, your arrangements, and I just got nowhere. It was I think it was learning "Hurt" by jo- I thought I thought oh that sounds really nice. Like, 
but um <laughs> i just gave up because <laughs> you know everyone has their niche and that definitely isn't mine but <laughs> okay. definitely, i definitely want to get around to like how you get to one but first i want to talk about like how you got started in music so you you were a classical guitar first wasn't it as yeah, a kid so, like yeah 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 um yeah, as a as a little kid, I was I was kind of very fidgety. I always had to be doing something with my hands. So uh, my my parents basically bought me a guitar uh, to keep me occupied <laughs> to stop me fidgeting. Um, yeah, I wasn't even particularly into music or anything. You know, I didn't ask for it. Just at the age of eight, they gave me a guitar and said, "Okay, stop fidgeting, play this instead." So um, I I started taking lessons. You know, uh, proper classical guitar lessons, did all the, the grades and, and, you know, diploma, a performance diploma at the end of it. And, you know, I, I enjoyed it and, and I was good at it, but I never had any, uh, any, any desire for classical guitar to be a career. You know. um, but I was, I was lucky enough to have a, a fantastic guitar teacher, a guy called Richard Turner. This was when I was growing up in Macclesfield. And, and, yeah, I've since lost touch with him. I don't, you know, he, he may have passed on by now. I don't know. But he was a fantastic guitar teacher because he, he was a real kind of renaissance man. He, he mm. wasn't just teaching the classical guitar. He was teaching the history of music. Yeah. You know, and there, there would be guitar lessons where we wouldn't touch the guitar. We'd just sit down in front of a record player and play me Miles Davis or John Coltrane. Yeah, I had and, one of them as well. I think it, it's very... Yeah. It, it forms something in you like this love of music when you meet someone like that at a young age yeah, yeah. Chris Faby well Chris if you're listening same here like he I remember him talking about Pythagoras and the notes and all this and his wife as well also influenced me like you know and it, meeting someone like that when you're young just makes such a difference it almost you, you can almost pinpoint your start of your musical career to that one person can't you well, absolutely that's it you know he's just sheer enthusiasm for music mm. and and you know, you know, not just even just listening to records. We we would sit and read French poetry on occasional lessons. You know, and he would he would he would you know explain to me how that is related to music, you know, the musicality That's of poetry class. and, and the, the rhythm of words and, and so on. And uh, you know, it, it he he gets that that enthusiasm across to you, but he also kind of links music to life. You know, it, it's mm. not just you're not just sitting there playing notes in abstraction yeah music is all around us it's part of everything we do you know it's it, even just talking now there's rhythm there's cadence there's pitch yeah. you know, and and in a way it can all be music and it, it just makes you think you know this is an important thing in life. and it's not just a hobby it's not just a bit of fun you know this this relates to everything around you. and yeah, yeah I, I was very lucky to meet that and how many years did you go, Tim, for for the classical guitar? Uh, that was from eight to uh, seventeen. All right, and, G- and you spent a lot. Was... So you really knew this. Yeah. You spent a lot of time with this guy, like you know. Yeah, yeah, that, that was would be pretty much pretty much every week for, for those eight. Did nine he bring years, you out for yeah. a pint when you finally got to eighteen? Like you... <laughs> the last lesson I had with him, yeah, we we kind of sat and read Baudelaire. I said about French poetry. <laughs> you know, we we were looking at the musicality in, in Baudelaire poems, and and with a glass of cognac each. <laughs> First <laughs> time I'd ever tasted cognac. Well. Fantastic. He's he's a lot classy. <laughs> I teach as well, but he's a lot classier to me. Like, because I have a few students <laughs> that I'm big fans of. Like, and I've said to their parents. But when I can't wait till he's older and we can go for a pint, but we're not reading Baudelaire around in my <laughs> Maybe I'll bring in the poetry, like my it, it sparks something in them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then, you know, how I got from classical guitar to playing the bass uh, is, is is kind of another story. But again, you know, while while I was playing guitar, uh, you know, I was playing classical guitar and I hadn't touched, I didn't touch bass until I was fifteen. Um, and, and up to about the age of 15, I think I kind of had no interest in pop music or, you know, it, it just didn't do anything for me. Mm. You know, I, I, I just didn't follow it, so I didn't particularly listen to it. Um, but then um, around about the age of, it must have been, yeah, yeah 13, 14, uh, secondary school, I was, uh, the, I, I went to like a fee paying school. I was a, you know, swatty kid. So, so I went. I went to a nice school, and they, they had instruments in the music yeah. department. They had you know, piano, drums, and uh, electric guitars, amps, and 
this thing that I thought was just a big guitar or <laughs> easy guitar because it only got four strings on it. <laughs> My father still thinks I played a banjo. Is it four <laughs> strings or <laughs> banjo? Is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Um, you know, and, and one year, my, my form room, you know, our base room, if you like, was the music room. So I would spend, you know, lunch times in there, having me lunch with it. And, and the bigger kids would come in and, and they'd use that time to mess around on the instruments. And, and most of the time, it's just a guy on the piano, a guy bashing away on the drums and an electric guitar. And it's just a racket in the corner, which I kind of ignored. Mm. And then there was one, you know, just, just one day, uh, I, re- I remember suddenly it all sounded different. Suddenly the thing sounded big and cohesive and it sounded, you know, it got this warmth to it. And, and I, you know, I just turned around and I thought, what have they done? What, what, what's changed? And it was simply that a guy had plugged in the bass and was playing the bass. And that, that was, I can pinpoint it down to that moment. That's that amazing. I, I want to play that. <laughs> Do you remember what type of bass it was or anything like yep, that? Yeah, because I played it. You know, religiously, like every lunchtime after that, <laughs> you know, um, it was a West Tone Thunder. I don't know if you remember West, those. Or the West Tone, yeah, yeah. West Tone, are yeah. they Scottish or something? Though that brand, oh, I, I didn't know where it was from. I thought it was probably a cheap Japanese, Chinese thing, is it? Yeah, maybe, but um, it, it was perfectly fine bass. You know, <laughs> it made it made the right noises. Yeah, like, yeah. I, you know, I would mess around on that every lunchtime for a couple of years there at school until I got my own bass. It is kind of common though the classical guitarist becomes a bass player, isn't it? I think then the bass player of the Stranglers wasn't he classical guitar first? Yeah, yeah. Well, again, I mean, I, I have this thing. You know, I, I talk to students about it, and I notice it in students that um, classical guitar technique. Oh, if it, yeah, and um, what you would call a uh, classic bass guitar technique has much more in common with classical guitar technique than it does with, say, electric guitar technique. Mm. You know, it, it's about you know, bass guitar technique, if you're talking finger style to begin with. Um, it's about getting a good, strong attack and tone to get a really nice, authoritative tone out of, out of the instrument. And, you know, if you do classical guitar study properly, you'll spend the first couple of years just focusing on getting a decent tone out of your fingers. Mm. You know? Um, and you know, even down to the mechanics of it, you know, in classical guitar, you tend to use. I mean, obviously, you have kind of freestyle finger picking, but you, there's a lot of um, apoyando or rest stroke, which again is ideally what you use on a, on a bass guitar yeah. to get that good strong tone. Mm. Um, so yeah, classical guitarists kind of have an advantage there. I mean, that they've you know, they, they've learned the correct left hand positioning as well because on a, on a bass that's even more important because of the size of the thing and the yeah. kind of stretches you have to make um and you know i do find classical guitar- guitarists definitely have an advantage over electric guitarists moving to the bass i think the left hand yeah. technique on the bass is like a dark art or something like that and i even find it hard to explain myself to my students because they should have one finger per fret but then most of the time I don't. I I do this Mandel method where I have my first finger, my second finger, and my pinky, and I'm okay. moving them around, yeah, yeah. and then I go to yeah. the four fret, four finger, one finger per fret if the bass line requires it. So yeah. and to explain yeah. that to someone is it hard? Like to say you should have one finger per fret, but mo- but most of the time I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a case of do as I say, not do as I do. Yeah, yeah. I mean I, I I'm the same that um. You know, I'm very aware when I watch my videos back, not so much when I'm actually playing, but when I watch the videos back, my, my little finger is kind of underused in most cases. Mm. You know, a lot of the time, I'll, I'll be just using first and third. Okay, really? You know, yeah. I, I mean, I, I kind of justify it. By, you, know, you think of uh, Django Reinhardt, the great jazz guitarist. Mm. You know, his left hand was, was crippled in a fire, so he only really had two usable fingers, and he was still able to play the most wonderful lines you know yeah so it, it's it's not really uh, an impediment no no i, I mean <laughs> i, saw, that, I saw les paul actually the year before he died and he had really bad arthritis and his hand was kind mm-hmm. of and he, he was django was his hero so i'm sure that's what he kept going he didn't yeah. care but he could still play like these fast lead lines but 
he only Absolutely. had like i think two fingers working properly at the yeah. time yeah. well i i find and, and again it's something I've, I've actually learned more from doing solo bass arrangements in the last couple of years that um it's a lot to do with with deciding how you're going to finger these things you know mm. you you can get a better kind of articulation often by instead of you know crossing a string doing the hammer on up the string whatever and and you can kind of find ways around that, that don't require you to do the, the the one finger per fret thing. Yeah, and so and I think I think my my technique has just kind of you know tended that way anyway without me particularly thinking about it. Mm. Um, particularly as I say because I'm I'm learning lead lines and and trying to articulate them as a singer or a horn player would articulate them, which is very different to how uh, a bass player would normally articulate those things. But from watching your videos on YouTube, like you'd be thinking, this guy is not going to get a single gig playing real bass, quote unquote. But you have done a lot of work, like just playing what would be considered yeah. traditional well, bass. Like, yeah, this is this is my big my big rant. <laughs> you know, I was expecting this. this. I was thinking about this during the week, and I was like, will I will I rant on this or will I let Carl? <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, what what people see online, uh, people love to put other people in a box they like like to say okay that's what that guy does that's what this guy does you know and that sums it up um yeah i mean <laughs> uh you can't do that stuff on a gig with a band you know you, you mm. absolutely can't and and that's right if i tried to do that i, I would never get hired again <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm, I'm well aware of that and equally you know uh, and I would say pretty much any bass player out there who's doing the, the fast, flashy stuff to get YouTube views, I, they, if they're any good at all, they don't do that. Mm. You know, they're, they're just doing that because they know the flashy stuff gets the views, gets the attention, you know, gets their name out there. Um, you know, 99% of the time, they'll be playing the bread and butter stuff. And, but, yeah, people like to make these assumptions like like to put you in a box um and it doesn't on me <laughs> and 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 to be fair it, it has it has affected uh certain gigs uh since you know that, that i might have got yeah i know you know through the grapevine or whatever that somebody has said no you don't want that guy look, look at these videos this is what he does That's and i like, no, <laughs> i don't do that all the time but <laughs> Yeah. But, but it swings and roundabouts. But Victor you know? Wooten was saying the same thing. Victor Wooten was saying he doesn't get called for as many gigs as he'd hoped to because yeah. they don't know that he plays traditional bass. But of course he does. Like he's a monster musician. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it, you know, even Stanley Clark and Marcus Miller, these guys, mm. you know, they they didn't get where they they are now by doing crazy flashy stuff. They they got there. By working their way up, you know, mm. play, paying their dues in regular bands, whether bar bands, or jazz bands, whatever, just doing what was necessary. And they've just reached a point in their career where, you know, they can do what they want to do under their own, you know, their own, uh, their own steam. You know, yeah. they can be their own boss. Um, you know, and, and yeah, it's it's madness that people think that's that's all they can do. Well, yeah. <laughs> as if you turn up to a gig like and just be doing all these solo arrangements and the band are like we're yeah. trying to play wagon yeah. wheel will you stop doing that exactly yeah but, i mean the thing is even when you're doing solo arrangements you kind of got to be aware of, of the fact that you know melody is king you know if there's a singer if there's a, a horn line going on uh you know there's something playing a melody that is what the human ear focuses on yeah you know that that is the important thing. So if you're off of the dusty end of the guitar neck or the bass neck, you know, playing you know crazy jazz scales mm. while that melody is going on, you're pulling focus. You know that's yeah. that's that's the wrong thing. You're not doing your job, and rightly you shouldn't be fired for that. Yeah, you know, if they could just stop thinking that you're playing the bass when they're listening to your arrangements and just be like, does it sound good? Yes. Okay. It's good then. Well, and exactly. I stop thinking we shouldn't be doing that on the bass. Yeah, and 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 yeah, and the point I'm, I was kind of moving to there is that okay, I'm playing the melody, but I am also playing the bass underneath that. Mm. And um, you 
you become increasingly aware of how that baseline underneath the melody kind of gets in the way of the melody if you could if you throw too much in there yeah and um, and you know if if we get a chance to go through you know putting a solo arrangement together um you'll see how you know you've got to be really tasteful about where you put in any little extra bits in mm. the baseline underneath that melody otherwise you're just getting in the way you're you're getting in the way of that melody you're pulling focus you know, sure. so it, well, we may as well dive yeah. into it, like, because I'm actually curious to, how, to know how you put these things together. Because, like I said, I attempted to learn some of your lines, and I gave up. I was like, I, I'll just leave Carl explain how he does it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, it a lot of it depends on the song in the first place. Yeah, every song is different. Um, I, I, I've, I've gone through a phase. You know, recently doing um, jazz standards, well, because I, I love them and I've, I've played them for years in jazz band. And I've always thought, it would be nice to be able to play that all on my own. <laughs> you know? yeah. And um, so, you know, there is there is definitely a kind of formula for for those types of songs, um, where, for example, there's there's no defined baseline. You know, you can listen to a dozen different recordings of. Uh, I don't know, all of me and the yeah. bass players will be doing different things you know so um, what you've got is is a chord you know or a set, a set of chords and you work around those however is appropriate mm. um, so arranging that kind of song is very different to arranging say um, Seven Nation Army where the bass line on the record is the song yeah, <laughs> you know, you have you have to maintain that bass line um, as much as playing the melody. You know, so so there's that's a slightly different job in itself. So it, it often depends on the type of song you're looking at um, as to how you go about it. But there are a few kind of um, general approaches which I can kind of talk us through. If you uh, like. yeah, so, and what at what um, point at what point do you know like if the song can be played? on one bass because on some of your videos you do a duet with yourself but on most of them it's just the one bass playing the whole thing like how do you know when when you say look carl you're you're only human you need a sec you need a second person to do this song well well that's it exactly um that will be a, a few hours into trying to work it out you'll realize i can't do this this physically is impossible or you can do it in a way that isn't comfortable to you and doesn't come across musically. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm. what, what, what I mean by that is you can you can basically arrange anything if you're prepared to do two-handed tapping. Yeah. Yeah. Where uh, you know you can play the bass line with your left hand and, and tap the melody with your right. Mm. Yeah, I've done that with a few things. A bit of like an Ed Sheeran and um, uh, maybe Chariots of Fire or something. I can't remember. But um, to be honest, I don't like that sound. Yeah. You know, I don't like that tone. That, that to me, that's not the proper tone of the bass. Mm. Okay, it gets the job done, but it doesn't get it done in a way that I particularly like. And it so kind of would make I've... your arrangements a bit. You know, it'd be all be the same. It's like, oh, here he goes again. He's playing the bass line with his left hand. He's tapping the melody with his right hand. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, not I mean there's, a, there, there's a place for that, and, and guys like Stu Ham obviously you know, do that kind of thing fantastically. Yeah. And uh, a lot better than I can. <laughs> Charles so, Ber Bertold, the Bertold. new guy. Yeah, yeah. He's very good at brilliant it. Brilliant at that, yeah. Um, you know, so they've obviously spent years focusing just on that technique, which is fair enough. I haven't. You know mm. that. Yeah. For a start, you would never do that on a classical guitar. So that never occurred to me for years and years. I never mm. thought, but maybe I can do this. Um, doesn't, yeah. So I, I, that that side of my playing is, uh, you know, I don't really do that kind of thing. So if I'm in the middle of an arrangement and, and I reach a point where the only possible way I can do it is like that, I'll I'll have to decide: Am I prepared to do that for this passage? You know, is there too much of that? Um, does it detract from the musicality of the whole thing? Um, either because I can't play it as well as I want to mm. want it to sound, or because my bass doesn't sound how I want it to sound when I play with that technique. Um, so I, I have to weigh up at that point, you know, well, do I just put this one aside 
and played as two instruments, <laughs> which is you know often what happens. You know, because I, I generally I won't start a song unless I want to finish it. Mm. So, um, but yeah, sometimes that that, that happens. <laughs> and how much quicker are you at doing it? Like I'd say, when you started, you probably take a few days to do an arrangement. You, at this, you must you've done so many hundreds of them. You must be yeah. able to just do it like. Well, like again, it depends on the kind of song, but a, a, a jazz standard. I could, um, when I, I just had an idea for one last night, and by you know, by midnight, it was like three hours later. I basically got the bones of an arrangement. Mm. You know, so uh, I, I kind of have a formula for jazz stuff. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's, it means I can do that fairly quickly. Um, other stuff, it just depends, you know, certainly where you've got to maintain the bass line underneath the melody, that, that can be very tricky, you know, it, it, it limits your options for, for voicing. And... You, you must be an absolute master at rubbing your belly and tapping your head at the same time. Like. <laughs> well, actually, no. <laughs> I mean, in all seriousness, in all seriousness um, no, I mean, that's the main reason I don't sing, because... Yeah, I can't. I can't play a bass line and sing. It's the two seem completely counter to me. You know? <laughs> That's bizarre because um, your bass when you're playing your arrangements, you're you're doing completely different things at the same time. Like you're splitting your brain. Yeah, yeah. But again, I think it, it was something I learned to do at a very young age on on a classical guitar, and so that has stuck with me. I'm trying to learn to do that at a, you know an older age. You know, maybe my brain's just not so plastic or whatever at this point is to say no too much <laughs> computer says no so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, you know i mean guys like like mark King, for example and you know an absolute hero of mine you yeah. know, he played the most complicated bass line and yet he's singing against it counter to it and he's I, a big influence on your style went, i think mark king on the way you slap the bass because he's not yeah. a very aggressive slapper he's he, i'd say he's more efficient if you look at like oh, Lu- I, I, he does it well, hard, but like compared to Louis Lewis Johnson, who is literally tearing into the bass, like yeah, his arm is coming off the bass, and Mark yeah, King has more control. Like there's different styles I, I, of I, slapping. He's he's a kind of um, refined version. Yeah, refined. What, what Lewis Johnson is doing, I think. Yeah. Um, not there's not but, there's a right way and a wrong way, but no. there is different ways of doing slap and getting different <laughs> sounds, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I I was speaking to a guy back in London years ago. He um, had uh, he, he, he turned up to some some little gig back in the very early eighties, and level forty two as were I mean they were called something else even at that point I think um, were on the bill but for some reason Mark's bass wasn't working or he'd broken it or there was some issue anyway. so he needed to borrow this guy's bass <laughs> <laughs> and he gave him. You know, gave him the bass. Thought, okay, you know, what can he do in a two-hour set? You know, and he ended up watching the two-hour set like this, <laughs> you know, because Killing the way baby. the way Mark, yeah, exactly. He'd never seen anything like this. Really? This was the early eighties. He'd never seen Mark play before. Mm. Never seen anybody do this to a bass before. Like, what is he doing to a bass? <laughs> and he took took the bass back, and you know. The, Grooves in the in the pickups. And, oh my god! And, you know, <laughs> well, dense marks the in the threads. It more now, though, played by Mark <laughs> yeah. King, destroyed by Mark King. And that's it. And he just said, that "The man is an animal." <laughs> that's cla- maybe maybe that's why he uses the graphite next, is it? Because they don't get chewed up, like. Uh, possibly, yeah, yeah. Possibly, there's a bit of that, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, a lot of what I do, you know, a lot of the slapping techniques that I use were just picked up from from watching videos of him. Really? There was a video. Yeah, there was a um, live at Wembley. I think it was the classic level forty-two video, mm. and, and I, I would just watch that for hours, just watching what his hands were doing and, and kind of trying to emulate the rhythms, as it were. But in my own way, you know, I, I never really kind of sat down with books and tab to work mm. it out. So actually, my my technique is slightly different to his. I've since discovered that you know, I, I um, a big part of what he does is um, tapping with the fretting hand to get ghost notes the ghost notes so, yeah yeah i mean there, there's two or more schools of uh, slap bass playing you've kind of got the um larry graham school and mm. then you've got the lewis johnson school you know larry graham it's all in the, the thumb it's yeah, all well, I've, the, I've been trying right to hand. i used to do loads of slap i was in a funk metal band when i was 17 and i 
I, I see I know it is pointless playing it because I'll never do it live, but it's fun though. But I want to yeah. learn how to slap with my thumb going up the way because I learned with my slum my thumb down like flea, and it do, yeah. it slows you down and you can't do the double thumbing. So yeah. if if I am <laughs> going to get back into it, I have to reinvent the way I play it. Yeah, you have to string the bass up right under your chin. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's how to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, as I say, a, a lot of what he does is is between the two hands. Um, whereas you know Larry Graham is all in the one hand and Marcus Miller I think is more that style as well all the rhythm comes from the right hand whereas with Mark there's kind of this continuous stream of 16s and and half of them are played with the left hand just tapping on Mm. the strings and uh, again that's kind of where my where my uh, left hand fretting technique has come from why my little finger doesn't get as much use as it should is that it's often actually being used to tap the strings mm. on this this hand. So I'm only really using the first three fingers for fretting. The little finger is doing the tapping. Um, but I, I've realised I actually do more with my left hand than Mark does. He, he if you watch him trying to, you watch him playing something like Lessons in Love, which is that kind of galloping rhythm. And dun, yeah. dun, 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 dun. He's thumbing every one of those. Mm. I I don't. He has tape on his thumb as well, doesn't he? He taped up the thumb. Yeah. So um, you see, I I actually tap one of those with my left hand. So my right hand is only doing half as much work. You know, at no point do I really string too many right hand thumps together. You know, my my body just won't do that. So it it means, you know, I have to adapt some of the things that he plays to my Way. so they come out slightly different I'm yeah, i think everyone exactly has to get their like own it. style don't they just watch the people, watch the exactly, masters yeah. but then do it your own way yeah yeah <laughs> right let's do an arrangement of a song so for the crack all right, right. so uh, what, um, what would you think is like uh, it's probably it's like getting asked in a music shop play something for me and your mind goes <laughs> blank uh, well, is there any arrangement you think or are proud of you know and, and kind of shows off what you do in particular or do you just want to just do anything <laughs> Well, I, I think the way to do it, I was thinking about this because you did kind of pre-warn me you might want to do a bit of this. So Here's one I, I prepared I thought, earlier, John. Yeah, there's, there's a bit of that, but there's also a bit of kind of deviation and you'll see you'll see a few of my greatest hits, if you like, as, as examples of, of okay. techniques that I'll be using. Um, so, I mean, the, the first thing I say is that you've, you've got to look at the key of the song. Yeah. Um, you know, even if that just means writing out all the chords so you know your root notes. Um, because on the bass, obviously, we're, we're kind of limited. I mean, we've got three octaves. Most people have three octaves mm-hmm. on their bass. But because uh, I use a four stroke, um, we don't have the kind of depth across the fretboard, uh, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah. We've got the length, but we haven't got the depth. <laughs> I, always know, I always thought, why doesn't he just use a six string? And then your life would be a lot easier. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, again, a lot of people say that, but <laughs> I, I have my reasons. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I like four. I like, I like the simplicity of it. I like the space. Mm, same. You know, I, yeah. I feel very uncomfortable on the five string. and I've never even played a six yeah. string. Yeah, I, I had a five string briefly, and... Uh, it just, just having a B on the bottom didn't feel right. I, I wanted that E there all the time. And, and you know, the strings were that little bit close together. I didn't like it. You know? So, um, you know, sometimes I'm asked to play low Bs, you know, on, yeah. in sessions or gigs, whatever. So I have a bass that is strung up B, E, A, mm. D. Yeah, I've done that yeah. before. Yeah, it actually yeah. works pretty well. It does, yeah. I mean, it's fine. It maintains at least the... the space <laughs> you know but um as i say i mean i can just if i just show you the base yeah, grab a bit i hope this what comes I mean through, by, um, through zoom for us now but that's a nice one is that a, a warwick i haven't yeah. seen that one before no it's a headless oh yeah you're um, obsessed with these shack. headless bas- you love these headless right. ones. and carbon fiber as well yeah. nice. <laughs> a very early carbon fiber place german thing um, so, so anyone who's listening and not watching, Carl just pulled out uh, a lovely bass. How would you describe what's the finish? It's kind of a brownie. Um, uh, yeah, it's. I think it's quilted bubinga. Quilted bubinga. Um, yeah, I mean, this I found this on eBay. It's a beautiful. It's very deep. You know, these here, these, that's actually a gouge. You know, this guy whoever had it before me really 
you know, played it to death, mm. you know, but it's, you know, it's good, honest wear, you know, it's not, you guys dropped it. This is just, you know, wear and tear from playing. <laughs> you know, yeah, so that's cool. Like it's that. worn in, you know, he did the, yeah. he wore it in for you. <laughs> Broke yeah. It in. And uh, yeah, it's a Shack Carbon V2. Not many of them around. And uh, Never it was even passive. Heard brand. No, they're still going. They don't, they don't make these anymore. And I don't think they even make headless braces anymore. Um, but when I got it, it was passive and I stuck a John East preamp in there. So it's, it's cool. active now. Um, but yeah, so what I mean by uh, we, we have three options from the bottom E to, to that E. Yeah. Um, but you have but, like 24 frets or more than uh, 24 frets to on that B. All my bases have 24, yeah. So 24. I, like, I like to have that top end range. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's sometimes a problem for my transcriptions that people buy them and they say, but I'm using a Stingray. <laughs> you know, <I'm> <laughs> yeah, I found that really annoying. Frets. I bought like um, <laughs> a book off one of these guys, on jazz guys online, but he had written it for like, uh, an extended range base and i was it was quite annoying <laughs> to be honest <laughs> but what can you do yeah yeah so we have those three optives but if you're having to finger a baseline as well realistically that's about as much as you can manage you can get as far down as the f sharp there at 14 if you're threatening that mm. high e so you've lost this octave down below the 14th fret on the e string yeah. You know, you, you just can't use that. Um, so our, our range is limited on the bass, unless you use open strings as much as you can. <laughs> so you will okay. change the key of a song to give yeah. you open strings. I, I have a kind of love-hate relationship with this. That, um, yeah, if, if necessary, I, I will. So, you know, if, if you see everything is Fs, B flats, A flats, you know, E flats, you, you know, you're probably going to have a problem there making that sound really nice and beautiful because on the bass, more than any instrument, you need the separation between the bass note and the melody note. Mm. If they're too close, you know, or too, especially if they're close down here, it's just muddy. You just, it's just muddy. Yeah. You, know, you can't, the, ear, the human ear just can't process that properly. Mm -hmm. Up here, you, you can get away with closer harmonies. Just, the waves are smaller <laughs> you know your ear can do it's funny isn't but, it like um on the bass i think tents sound amazing that that just I, yeah there you go yeah but it doesn't sound yeah. that amazing on other instruments but when you play on no. the bass it's like, <laughs> wow that's such a nice car yeah and, and that's it the, the bass has a, a, a unique voice all its own doesn't it, and it, it it's does. a shame it's a shame not to use it for melodies you know mm. I, I don't understand why people would not use it for melodies but there you go, I digress. So, yeah, I mean, I have a love-hate relationship with transposing things. If I can if I can get away with not transposing, um, I'd, I'd much rather, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, a small digression here. I, uh, I, I had a friend, have you ever heard of synesthesia? It's not a band, it, uh, it's a condition. <laughs> uh, this, uh, wait, no, don't, don't tell me, wait. Synesthesia is that is that the one where you see uh, music in colors? Yeah, or vice versa, uh, or it, it, yeah, it's confusion of any senses. Like okay, that. yeah. You see, I, I had a friend back in um, back in London who had a you know very pronounced case of this, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and and he was a musician, so he was able to articulate it nicely too. Cool. And uh, he, you know, so you can play a D minor chord at him. I you mean, can get that if you just eat a load of shrooms as well. <laughs> <laughs> True. Well, well, yeah, I mean, maybe that means it's something latent in all of us. Maybe, you know? yeah. yeah, yeah. And, Break it down. And, yeah. <laughs> so, so you could play a D minor chord at him and, and you could say, yeah, well, that, that's blue to me. You know, and, and it's, it's not just the pitch, it's the tone as well. Yeah. It all contributes, you know. It's hard so, to imagine yeah. when you don't have it, isn't it? Like, it, it, yeah. it would yeah. be pretty cool exactly. to have. <laughs> <laughs> But then you could play an E chord at him and he'd say, well, no, it's a completely different colour. Yeah. So and it just occurred to me then talking to him, he said, well, what happens when you trans transpose a song? I, you know, and, and he said, well, my ear is telling me it's the same song, but it looks and sounds wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, well, well, that's it. So, you know, if he was asked to play a song in a key, but, you know, not the original key, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he'll play all the right notes, but it just doesn't feel right for him because it's not giving off the same colors. That's bizarre. You I know? never heard and, I, and, I say I never heard that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's weird. Um, I so, played in a band with someone with perfect pitch before, and it was difficult because he'd get pissed off and I'd make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I imagine this guy. I never played in a band with him, but he was a brilliant musician, and and he you know he had a touch of OCD as well. So <laughs> so it really bugged him when things were the wrong color. <laughs> so um, it, it made a difference to him. He said, you know, it's practically a different song if you transpose. And I kind of know what he means. You know, it makes me think of that, that spinal tap quote. The, uh, oh, um, is it D minor? Uh, yeah, is the D minor, yeah. key? <laughs> there we go. That's the one. And okay, I mean, it, it was a joke, but actually there's something in it. There is. Certain, but, different um, keys do have a tonality to them, you might yeah, say. That's it. They, they, they have a different feeling. And, and it's not something you can always articulate or have ever been able to articulate. But, um, it's, it's if you change the key of the song, it does seem to change the feeling, and and that bugs me in a way. So I I, I try not to. <laughs> yeah. But you know sometimes sometimes it, it's unavoidable. Uh, I mean an example is uh, I am, I I did a level forty two number. Um, there's an early one called Heathrow, uh, an instrumental. And I wanted to do that as a solo bass arrangement, and uh, it's in F, I think, uh, the original. Yeah. So um, you nice. try playing. Coming, that's coming true really clear. This is you're the first yeah. bass player to play the bass <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. The trouble is with the headphones on; it's not clear to me at all. <laughs> it actually is coming through <laughs> grandly. <laughs> Very good. So I mean, the melody is something like. It's up here, so you'd have to play your F up here. So you've lost all the bottom end already. Mm -hmm. So um, I ended up transposing the whole thing down down to E. Uh, so uh, you ended up with something like. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's basically the, the first part of the theme. Mm. But you know, you couldn't you couldn't do that now because uh, I need that open E to be able need to play the, it the, underneath the pedal. Underneath. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes there is an argument for, for changing the key. So I mean, the next point then I guess is um, you've got to know the melody. You know, the the melody is is. Is as I've said it before, the melody is key. It's mm -hmm. it's key. So for this, um, uh, for the purposes of this, you know, this was something I was working on. What, this do, what are we learning? What are we imaginarily making out today? Yeah. <laughs> as if I just uh, put yeah. you on the spot to do it. Yeah, well, it's it's a relatively new one, so I'm still a little unsure of it myself. But a jazz standard called um, "Have You Met Miss Jones?" Yeah, uh, it's one it's I actually one don't know. No, all right. <laughs> Um, I think uh, Robbie Williams murdered it on a movie soundtrack a few years ago. Robbie. That's the most most famous version of it. But, um, Actually, when I was in yeah. England last, uh, there was a Blobby Williams was in the venue the, the week before. <laughs> <laughs> you have some weird tribute bands in England, I have to say. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so anyway, you've, you've got to, the first thing you've got to do is sit down and learn the melody, you know. Um, and with jazz standards like Have You Met Miss Jones, uh, it, it can be difficult to find the definitive melody. So find one you like, and then you know sit down and, and, and work those notes out, or, or find a decent transcription of it. Um, but the, the important thing there is really to try to um, play that melody uh, as 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 a vocalist would sing it, or as a horn would play it. Which is very different, as I said before, I think, to, to how a bass player would normally play. Mm -hmm. You know, normally it's, it's the bass player's job to, to to nail down the one and hold the steady rhythm. You know, to keep keep everybody else 
together. Yeah. You know, as melody lines, lead guitarists, they then have the freedom to kind of slide across bar lines, you know, if you come in a little before the beat. And even like the bass drum might be busy on some songs and the bass player is still simpler than what yeah, the bass yeah. drum is doing. Uh, I agree. I mean, I, I personally, I think it's, it's the bass player's job to be holding everybody down, not the kick drum. So many people mm. think that it's the kick drum. But yeah, it's the not. kick could it's have a push player. on like the doom, doom. But yeah. the bass player might still be just doing those solid notes. like. Yeah, yeah. So um, you, you kind of have to get into a different mindset. And, and this, this is one of those reasons, um, another little digression here, that why uh, you know, guitar, electric guitarists who then say, oh, I'm going to play a bit of bass, <laughs> often <laughs> bug me. I mean, there are exceptions. There are some very good you know, electric guitarists who also play bass. Actually, there's but, one um, um, bass player at the moment who is an electric guitarist, but he's better at the bass. What's his... Cody Wright, do you know the guy? Oh, yeah, 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 seen him on that. Yeah, so yeah, he managed. He managed to have the two brain, the split of the brain, yeah. the bass player, guitar player. Exactly, that, that's it. And the problem is that it is a different mindset. That uh, you know, a lead guitarist has that rhythmic freedom, kind of push and pull up the beat more than the bass player does. The bass player's got to nail it down. So you know, when as a bass player switching to playing a melody. You've got to kind of get into a different mindset and not feel that you've got to nail it down on one. And, and often, on, especially on jazz type things, the vocal is, is almost anticipating the chord change each time. So it's pushing the beat, and you kind of have to try and work that into your arrangement as well. So um, basically, uh, the, the melody of Have You Met Miss Jones is something like. Uh, <laughs> That's that's the first part of the theme. So that's step you, one. You've got the melody down. Yeah. That's the, now, that's the foundation. <laughs> it is. And and you notice I played it up here. Yeah, you know, if I played it down here, then you you don't you don't have enough notes below that. Uh, and and you get into that kind of muddy area. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So um so I would always try and start one of these melodies, you know, somewhere between say the ninth to you know. 19th fret you know that that is kind of the ideal uh, range for, for where you want your melody to be sitting um again there are exceptions but, but that, that's kind of a general rule. um the next thing i would do obviously is, is think about the, the the chords initially just the root notes don't worry yeah. about you know the extensions of the chords you know flat nines major sevens minor sevens doesn't matter just get the roots to begin with mm -hmm. And for that one, it's uh, we're in the key of F. I know I said we want to try and avoid F, but <laughs> it works on this one because you, you've got E's and A's as well. So, um, uh, yeah, so you start with F, goes to D, goes to a G, goes to a C, goes to A, D, G. So that that's that's. That main thing. That kind of fourth kind of movement of the jazz. Yeah, thing. exactly. Okay. Um, so then. Okay, so we have our melody, we have our bass line. Yeah, that's it. And then my next stage would be to just kind of block out at which point those chords change relative to the melody. See what I mean? Yeah. So if I try that F there with my old melody here. So I'm going to try and hold that while I'm playing these. So often there's a, there's a certain amount of finger juggling, finding a way and the right finger to use so that you can hold that note while you're playing that melody. <laughs> so, yeah. This is bizarre. This is so further removed from normal bass playing. It's brilliant. Yeah, well, that's right. This is how the classical guitar comes in because yeah. this, this is normal for classical guitars. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there you have. Now here you immediately have a problem because I, I'm hearing I need to go to the D in the bass now, mm -hmm. but my next note is there. So you're thinking, well, do I do that, which is yeah. painful, the other possible way. but painful, um, or even the open D there, mm -hmm. which just 
sounds off for some reason. I don't like that. <laughs> no explanation. It just doesn't sound good. So just you have to have a good knowledge of the names of the notes mm-hmm. on the fretboard to know that there's another C there. Yeah. So you can play that D there. Mm-hmm. So you get so you get your D there. Yeah. Then I know we want to go to this. So, and then we wanted a C. I played it there before, but I know the melody goes up here, so I need there's a C there. So you get that works nicely. And we're getting into stretch territory, but the next bass note I need is an A. So I may as well use the open one. Yeah. You know? There's the next part of the melody. So if you're listening. Um, card is up on the top of the neck there now he's, the op- he's pedaling with the open string <laughs> yeah. um, so at this point I need a D trouble is I'm fretting the D so I can't use that one so the D there too far away so that one it's high up but it'll have to do <laughs> you see, see, yeah. Then we're going to need a G. So I'll go for that one there. Yeah. It's nice, nice and handy with the 15th fret. And then we're back into the melody again. So, you know, it's at that point, it sounds like the tune. You know, you, you've basically got the bones of it. Then you want to kind of, it's nice just in a kind of dreamy way, but yeah. you probably want to give it a bit of movement. Next level. Yeah. So, the next point here, where we, we almost move into kind of Travis picking style. But um, as I say, if you haven't got a bass line that you need to maintain, you know, something like a Seven Nation Army or whatever, um, then you at least need to play in the spirit of, <laughs> of, of the tune. And, and mm. for a jazz standard, you think walking bass, four yeah. on the floor, you know. Mm. So, yeah. so, yeah, just start off with a, with a, a you know, a crotchet yeah. uh, bass note. So let me see. So it's getting there. It's got a bit of movement now. Need then some the chromaticism, next... or exactly that. That's it. That 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 sums up what um, you know, that that's one of the defining factors of a jazz bassline is, is that that kind of walking chromatics, you know, moving from one chord to the next. And um, as I touched on earlier, um, you you've got to be a little bit careful about how much of that you stick in. Because it, it can detract from, you know, it can pull focus from the, the melody. So you have to choose your moments. And here, you know, you, there, there's a few gaps in the melody where you can throw that kind of thing in. You know, the, the whole melody kind of ends well before the chord cycle, if you like. So there's a nice jazz turnaround you can do at the end of it. Um, and there's a few gaps in the melody. Gap there. So, um, Choose your moment. So here I would do something like. Yeah, no, it's cool to see your process like it. You, you could take this um, sample and work out any jazz song really this way, couldn't you? That's that's the bare bones of it. Um, at, at that point, I would then try and add some kind of um, harmonies. This is where the more extended chords come in, you know, the flat nines, major sevens, et cetera, et cetera. You can add those little extra details to fill it out a bit. Um, but again, how much you add and where is, is it's, <laughs> it's a matter of taste, really. Yeah. <laughs> but also, to a certain extent, it's, it's limited by the bass itself, you know, the four strings. If you haven't got a huge amount of separation between the notes, you're not going to be able to jam an extra one in between them as, you know, that, that harmony note. Mm. And with this, it's all quite close, to be honest. There's not a lot I can do. Yeah, no, I can't immediately see anything. I mean, I may do 
after running it a few more times. Mm -hmm. But I mean, again, a, a, a good example of where I was able to find lots of harmony and roots to throw in. So my example would be like the Pink Panther thing. I mean, this is always my party piece since this is the one that went viral. Yeah, um, yeah. So your your bass line is. Okay, so that's essentially what you're having to work with in the bass line and, and that is the song without that it's it's you know it's nothing Whatever it is you know there's not much to it so you've got to kind of try to combine those two bits and what i find works for me is um I'll actually sit down at Sibelius or the Beat of Ava and, and write out the two parts consecutively, mm. consecutively um, or simultaneously, I suppose it is, so that I can see visually on the page where notes are corresponding, notes in the melody, yeah. are, you know, are playing at the same time as notes in that bass line that I have to maintain. Um, and that, that really helps to kind of pull it all together. So this, you end up with... Um, Remember, it's been a while. <laughs> so there, that's where I switched to my, my B note. So mm. I'm playing that there, and the melody is moving up here at the same time. Um, yeah, it, it's a funny one, because I've played this for so long, dissecting it is it's kind of difficult. Yeah, it's just uh, most of the memories, just, it just, you just come yeah. out of it. Well, it's kind of it's kind of like that old fable of uh, the the millipede. Uh, did you ever hear that one? Uh, Which one? An ant, uh, an ant sees a millipede walking. No. You know, there's hundreds of little legs going. You know, an intricate pattern just to go forward. And the ant approaches the millipede and says, "That's fantastic. How are you doing that?" And the millipede just said, "I've never really thought about it. It just happens." <laughs> and, and he said, well, can, can you show me? Can you explain to me how you're doing that? And the military's like, well, move this on then and move that one and move this one. And I'm not sure. <laughs> and the poor millipede <laughs> never walks again. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that, that's kind of how I feel. <laughs> yeah. So when I try to analyze, you know, pull something apart that I've been playing for years, you know, it's it's. Uh, it can it can be like that. I can like, what was I doing? How does that work? No, I think you gave a good explanation of how it works, and people can find yeah. their own way now. <laughs> That's <laughs> you know, good. Yeah, knowing the route. But I, I'm interested about your gear though, because I can't yeah, yeah. see it. I can't see you doing these bass lines on a, a 61p bass or something like that. Like you, yeah. you, you have a lot of headless <laughs> guitars. They're all active. They're, they're, yeah. they're extended range, like. Well, uh, I suppose if, if by extended range you mean 24 frets. Yeah, that's what I call <laughs> that's extended. It. I mean, <laughs> that's it. Okay. Compared to the ones yeah. I have, it's extended. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love a carbon fiber necked bass, you know, of which this is a very early example. Um, uh, just for sheer practicality, um, you know, you don't get dead spots. You know, with wood, there are natural um, you know, imperfections, flaws. A any wood next place I've ever played, there'll be notes where you kind of have to compensate a little bit because you mm. know it's going to it's gonna howl or it doesn't quite ring out like the others. Carbon fibre kind of, it, it doesn't completely eliminate that. Occasionally, there's still one or two, mm. but it's it's more predictable. That's cool. I've never mm. had one, but might look into yeah. getting one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, some people don't like tone. Um because it, it is very immediate. And, you know, it feels like you hit the note and it's right there in your face. There's no bloom to it, you know, which with a nice wood bass, you know, sometimes you like that warm bloom to the note, you know. Yeah. Um, it kind of swells a little bit. I like all um, different, I uh, have a variety of basses here, like hollow bodies, yeah. uh, passive, active, you know, depends on the sound you're looking for. But for what you're doing, I think you need a, a need an active bass with extra frets because... Well, yeah, the break, I mean, the, the act, true, like. yeah, the the active thing, I I agree, it kind of has to be, and that's why I, I stuck actives in this, even though it was passive to begin with, um, because you need to be able to scoop that sound properly for a start, you know, um, just to to get that kind of separation between the bass note and the melody note, you need a sound that is 
kind of EQ ever so slightly scooped and maybe a bit of a peak somewhere in uh, 1K um, just to give it that speaking voice. Yeah, so it's, it's not a natural sound. You know, it's not how I would EQ my basses if I play in a you know, band. Mm. Oh, you're definitely um, getting fired down here with the <laughs> scooped bass <base>, so. <laughs> Get out. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I'm, I'm very different to you. I know you say you've got all these different types of basses. I'm the opposite. Mine are all the same. <laughs> Mine really. all do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I like to yeah. pick up a different one because it makes me play something different, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I, I love a wide, flat neck. I mean, that, that's just the classical guitar thing where the, mm. the neck has got to be, uh, you know, the fretboard completely flat, um, not too deep, not too kind of thick that way, you know. Um, I mean, the, the other thing with the headless thing, um, again, I, I don't understand the kind of resistance to it. I do think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a step forward. Yeah, I, but, I played um, one for about a year in a band. It was belonged to the guitarist. It was a fretless, homemade, headless bass. And it was a dog <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, homemade. So it fires off alarm flares for me. <laughs> but yeah, um, headless, I, I do think it's a step forward. You know, I'm, I know lots of people don't agree with me for aesthetic reasons or, or whatever, but, you know, I, I, I can and I have. A, you know, broken a string and replaced it, you know, before the chorus has come around. Mm. You know, there's no winding around yeah. thing that you, you just cool. get your double ball slotted in there, slotted in there and tune it up and you're done. That's it. And, uh, you know, on small stages, you know, you've know, you got a good few inches more yeah. room on the end there <laughs> to avoid whacking your singer. I think it's the look that puts people off. They just don't think they look aesthetically pleasing. Like. I guess it is. I guess it is. But, you know, I... I I like it. <laughs> and you have some signature so, models, don't you? What it Bogart and just check. I, is, I do, yeah. Like, like don't Bogart this joint, is that <laughs> I, I'm not sure what the origin of it is, yeah. Um so yeah, for a long time I was using um a, a status graphite king base, you know, the Mark King model. Uh, which and I still have two of them over there. Um which again are, are headless, uh, graphite necked tiny little body on them as well. I mean, I, I, again, this is why I don't, I can't get on with P bases or jazz bases, because they feel huge. <laughs> I like <laughs> that. I like, it, I like the I way know, it yeah, limits exactly. my hand and how fast <laughs> I can go. <laughs> yeah, well, this is it. You know, horses for courses, you know, different strokes for different folks. But I, I just can't get on with something that big and slab-like. Mm. <laughs> I prefer something smaller and more moulded. And the king base is lovely. It's got a kind of convex... Is it convex? Yeah, that way. Convex top on it. Um, so it's really nice and kind of uh, ergonomic. And I've been using that for a few years. And um, I was approached, uh, I think it's two years ago now, by um, a guy called Stefan Hess, who is the owner and operator and chief craftsman. Um, I mean, it may even be a one man business um, of uh, a German company called Bogart, who make bases. And um, he, he'd heard one of my, well, he's heard a few of my videos, but he'd particularly taken with a uh, kind of solo arrangement I did of um, Simon and Garfunkel, Sound of Silence. Um, and, and he thought, you know, he told me, he thought when he heard that, well, that sounds lovely on one of my bases. Um, so, so he wrote to me and, and said, you know, I enjoy your, what, what you do. Um, how would you feel about, um, me making a signature model for you. You know, I'll, I will send you one base, fairly standard setup, uh, play around with it a bit, tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like, and then um, I'll make you a second one, which is, you know, to your specifications. That must have been a pretty nice email to get. To it, it was fantastic. Sitting there yeah. in your underpants, eating your cornflakes. <laughs> oh, someone's going to give me a base. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I was stunned. You know, I, I thought for a while, you know, it's a joke, sure. I can't, <laughs> I can't believe it, you know. Um, and I, I, the amazing thing was, you know, both are my bases, which are headless and carbon fiber, yeah, they're <laughs> which is what I was match. using already. Exactly, <laughs> that's it. You know, I, I was thinking, you know, if I ever, you know, when I in in my wildest dreams, I was thinking, you know, if I were to ever have a signature base, it would kind of have to be a status. 
Yeah, because you, know, you didn't know any other brand so was doing it. Like. Exactly, that's it. And uh, and, I, and I was like, well, that's never going to happen because they've got Mark King. <laughs> they've got Chris <laughs> Walston home. You know the guy from News, yeah, the yeah, yeah. guy from guy from Slipknot as well. They, you know, they got huge names mm. who have their own signature status places. They don't need, me. <laughs> you know, so that so that wasn't going to. Hey, don't, so. hey, now, hold, don't, <laughs> don't say that yet. You, you could get another email tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, I I, I love those places, um, but I and I just thought, well, you know, I can't can't find better than that, surely, for for what I do. Yeah. And um, well, they're anyway, quite pricey, aren't they? Like carbon fiber and that exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah, the, no, the price of very, any of those bases is going to be expensive. Exactly. It's a very specialized thing. So, um, you know, I did my kind of due diligence and looked up Bogart online, you know, just to see what it was all about. I'd heard the name vaguely and I didn't know why. Um, and, um, you know, I did, did my research and, you know, it turns out they were if you like the German equivalent of status, you know, because Stefan Hess and, and a couple of other guys were, were instrumental in, in you know, setting up the German carbon fiber business. Very German um, thing, like it's engineers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, so actually, and you know, he'd made a load in the, I think the late eighties, you know, mid eighties, late eighties, and then kind of disappeared for a bit. You know, he was doing other things and making carbon fiber dashboards and things for cars and what have you, you know, he will make all kinds of things. For yeah. um, and I, you know, I searched online and found a few examples of people playing Bogart bases. Um, and the best example I found was Stuart Clayton. I mean, you must know that guy. Again, another online bass player, mm-hmm. very big on YouTube. Does transcriptions of He's done a few level forty two transcriptions. I, I don't think I know. I don't. Yes. You see, there's so many guys, and it's like a, it's like an echo chamber. Like I follow a certain bunch of guys, and then I say to someone else, "You know this person on YouTube," and they don't know him. Like we all kind of have our little pool of so, people yeah. we follow. Right. Okay. Well, he's he's been there a while. He's worth looking at. Anyway. I'll Fantastic check him out. Player. Put him on um, the list. Yeah, and yeah, I mean the first video I found of. Sorry, <laughs> of, of um, Bogart being played was was him. You know, he had a lovely blue Bogart, and he was playing um, "Decode" by Alan Carroll. Again, favourite tune of mine. He was doing a great version of it. It was, um, it was a five-string Bogart, but I remember thinking it was a glorious sound. You know, it had all the kind of punch and and kick that uh, carbon fibre gives you, but it was warmer. It got warmer at the top end. It didn't get kind of scratchy. And because um, if, if I had one reservation about status, is they can get a little harsh at the top end if you push it. You know, it's just kind of a name. You know? So yeah. sometimes I would have to hold back on the top end um, just to stop it getting too harsh. Now, so you know, Bogart didn't seem to have that problem. So I thought, well, this, this could really be worth checking out. So you know, of course I said, yes, I'd love to. <laughs> and and you know, he do. <laughs> Stefan had also uh, really appealed to my ego because <laughs> he'd said you know i've only ever given two of these away for free before one oh. was to um ingo york who is a, a big um, german solo bass player uh, again i'd never heard it and i looked him up online fantastic stuff really mm-hmm. kind of ingenious um and the other one was tony levin oh yeah tony levin i know tony levin yeah (laughs) exactly yeah and and he used it apparently on on one of the secret world tours that peter gave him and uh you know it's good enough for tony levin it's it's certainly good enough for me i can imagine he people are always asking him for free stuff like so for him to reach out to you is brilliant yeah i i I was bowled over by that and so i mean he sent me Show you this now for your YouTube viewers at least. Yeah, uh, this was the I first describe. Comment, it's, uh, is that the Silver Surfer? Is it? It is. That's the Silver Surfer. Cool. Yeah. It's a, so, so headless, headless, course, silver uh, carbon base. fiber, but quite subtly kind of patterned on the back. How would you? What um, body shape would you? It's kind of well, a super it, strat cool. maybe. Or... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of a super jazz, isn't super it? Super jazz. Kind of yeah. sl- sl- very slimmed down jazz shape. Um, a little more modern and kind of aerodynamic, which mm. obviously solves the slab problem I have with jazz. It almost looks like something Adam Clayton would have had during the the, pop, the <laughs> disco or pop 
tours of you too. We have these crazy bases. Yeah, yeah. I guess it, it does a bit. Um, and you know, as soon as I plugged it in, it was it was perfect. You know, it's, mm. it's got that's a lovely looking base. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's got Bartolini pickups, uh, two stone bars. And again, like I said, you know, unlike you, all my bases are the same. I know what I like, yeah, and, yeah. and I make sure every base is like that. <laughs> You know, so this has got two soap bars, um, active null preamp, I think it is, which is a kind of boutique German company. And uh, yeah, I, I, I loved it um, and uh, played it for a, a year or so and said to him, well, OK, a few changes I'd like, if it's all possible. Um, just kind of uh, just tiny little things like um, the, the end of the fretboard here is mm -hmm. a tiny bit sharp. So when you're slapping, your finger kind of catches against that sometimes. And just roll that off for me. You know, and it was just fantastic to be able yep. to go back to a guitar maker and say mm. just the pettiest little that's, thing. That's awesome. And, yeah. and, and he would do it for you, you know. And uh, also what I found, um, again, this was from using a status king bass, um, which uh, I've got a Paramatrix, which was their latest iteration of that, which um, has two parametric mids, um, which feels like overkill at first until you, until you actually start using them. Um, now, on this, I've only got the one parametric mid. And what I always find is when I'm playing live, and, and actually when I'm recording as well, I will always cut a uh, low mid around about 100. Yeah. So that's what I was always using that mid parametric for just to get that that cleanness to get rid of the kind of boom and, and so on so the thing is if you're always doing that then that's that out of action <laughs> if you see what i mean yeah. you, you've got nothing else to sculpt with other than the bass and the treble mm. um so on on the, the you know the next one uh, i said would it be possible to get a you know two mid parametrics on uh, one which i could you know, using that way to, to clean out, clean out that kind of low mid, uh, and another which I can use to boost higher up to get a little, mm. little bit of extra bite or to make melodies sing out. You know, because um, the treble is often too high to do that. That, that gives you the real air at the top end. Um, it doesn't really give you the punch which I was looking for. Yeah, I have one active bass uh, Sire M7, and I, I still haven't got my head around all the knobs and stuff so <laughs> and actually that i remember seeing that and thinking they, they've done essentially what what the, the status parametrix is you know mm. they you know they've got a single coil but you know switches the coil tap switches yeah. as well haven't they for 400 quid like which is pretty amazing 400 yeah. 500 euros like <laughs> amazing they can do that yeah so I, I i wanted a little bit more flexibility on this you know something more like as you say the m7 or, or the status Parametrics, um, and and the the, the last little thing really kind of um, well <laughs> really petty, but um, as a classical guitar player, I actually have a little bit of a thumbnail. I like to keep that, mm. and and also you know for doing the solo arrangements, and I've had a little bit of nail to get a bit of crunch. It's Steve Lawson played. does that as well. Do you know the guy who does yeah, the exactly. solo yeah. albums? Yeah, again, a huge influence on me that guy. Oh, yeah, he's great he and a great character. Uh, great guy to listen to, like, he's inspirational. Yeah, yeah. It's just his attitude yeah. to bass playing and release and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, because I have that nail, and I tend to rest on the top of the pickup a lot, especially just if you're just playing with colored bands, or whatever, you're just doing the, the root notes on the bottom, mm. bottom string. I, I tend to rest there. I don't often play back towards the bridge much, I tend to rest on that front pickup. And over time, every bass I've ever had, I end up digging a little hole with my yeah, thumbnail see, in I there. Well, yeah. <laughs> and it's annoying as hell. You know, I... Uh, <laughs> I actually I, like I, it because it's a little groove for your thumb to go into. <laughs> yeah. I think you're the kind of person who wipes down their bass before every time they use it. And <laughs> I, I, I try to. In. Yeah, I, I try to. I try to do that with it. So um, on the next situation, which was this, this was... Uh, bronze the broad or copper yeah. finishes it that's right yeah uh, yeah copper or bronze i'm not sure 
<laughs> it's kind yeah. of in between, isn't I it? I like the shape a lot. It's very kind of yeah. modern. Again, it's exactly the same shape. Mm. Basically, Stefan has one mold. So all these bases are the same shape. Because this, I forgot to say, yeah, this isn't wood. Okay. This is a this is a composite material. It's a kind of foam, really? hard resin foam type stuff. There is a wood core in it. I think it's alder in this one. I think mm. spruce in the other, which does do something to the tone. You know, those who talk about tone woods, mm. I mean, I'm not sure about that myself. But yeah, I don't. Yeah, need, I don't know either. Cause <laughs> you can yeah. get like um, Dan Electros, which are actually made out of plywood. They sound yeah. great. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I'm not a huge subscriber to that, but um, but Stefan is. You know, he he does believe. You know, that tone wood in the centre. You know, all the hardware is bolted to that tone. Mm. He, he believes that makes a difference. So, as I say, the spruce in that, it's alder in this, which is a bit harder, so he says it gives it a bit more punch. And, yeah, I mean, it is, it is punchier, uh, if that's even possible. I love the finish, it anyway. That, that, did it take you long to difference. decide on your finish, your final finish for your base? Uh, yeah, it, it did, really. I knew I wanted a silver one, but then after that, I wasn't sure. And then I saw, I think it might have been Rob Trujillo, mm. um, Metallica's Metallica. guy. Um, I think, yeah, he had a kind of golden bronze one with kind of runes on it or something. So, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was kind of the inspiration for this. Why did you I call it, it the broadsword? The... Uh, just, several reasons, really. I mean, sonically, it, it just slices through everything if you need it to. Um, and, I, I, you know, the black and the copper spoke bronze, you know, it kind of gives it a medieval a little bit of a kind of medieval look, I think, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was just a cool thing. <laughs> I just liked it. Yeah, it so, is and, and here you see, you know, I've got a few extra knobs here because I've, I've now got the two, the two parametrics. Uh, a couple of switches because this has got LEDs in the, in the neck. How, bad, how, how heavy are they on batteries? <laughs> Uh, you'll get you get about three hours out of oh my God. batteries. You must go to yeah. Mr. Price a lot to get new batteries. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a, there's a, a few battery compartments in the back because it's active as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've got the the two parametrics there, and this uh, obviously is, is rolled that bit off for me, so it's nice and smooth mm. with my fingers up there. And we've got this. People often ask me, what the hell is that? Yes, I noticed that, yeah. <laughs> that, that well, that's is to stop me from making the groove, is it? Exactly. <laughs> it's a little groove that's ready cut in. Okay. Which, you know, extends between the two pickups, you know, above and across between oh, that's the cool. two pickups. I like that and, idea. you know, my thumbnail fits in there without damaging the finish. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. just a tiny thing, but I, I like it. It helps me. So, um... Yeah, and, and both of those, the, the Silver Surfer, that, that first version, is kind of the basic model, my signature. Are they commercially um, available? Like, can you go on, did yeah. you contact him and just say, I want one of your bases? Uh, yeah, that, that's it. You can you can just go to his website. I think it's bogart-base.de. Uh, and check the models, and there's the, the Carl Clues signature there. It's, yeah, a dream come true. <laughs> you know. Brilliant. Um, that, but, you know, class. is it... He's a, he's a custom builder as well, so you can have whatever options you want. So, you, you know, if you want that without the thumb groove thing or without the LEDs, so he can do all that. So, um, yeah, it, it was an amazing opportunity. Hey, well, you, you deserve it. Like, <laughs> after, Thank you. How, how many transcriptions have you done? 100? Over uh, two or three hundred? Over 100. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, a lot of work, like. This, I've, I've lost count now, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff up there. <laughs> well, you deserve all your success, Carl. I have to say, like. <laughs> well, I thanks ever so much. <laughs> and you, before we, you're finished, you're living in Galway, are you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Like, sure, just we might meet sometime for uh, having an old pint or something, you know. When yeah, it would <laughs> be nice. I, 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 think, I think we have actually met in person a couple of times before. Um, um, yeah, a I couple of festivals. You, oh, we did this crazy festival in Waterford years ago, and you were playing with Earthship. <laughs> That's right. It, yeah. What was it called? Was, um, um, oh, Rock on Ore. Yeah. And it was yeah, in, his backyard, <laughs> in this lad's backyard. And he had yeah. like the gift of the gab. He got every band, Mar Martin Gilligan. Well, if you're listening, he got every band in Ireland to come down and play in his backyard. He was he, he told us all, this is going to be epic. And it was, in fairness. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, the I, first I, day, I 10 blew away. Like, And then yeah. 
we turned the disco tent into something else and it was real father Ted. <laughs> yeah. No, well, that, I, I do love that about Ireland, this, this kind of, uh, sure, let's do it anyway kind of attitude. Yeah, it? it's that the seems... land of the festival, isn't it, like, in the summer? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that fun Obviously not going? this like, summer. Urchip. <laughs> not this summer, but Urchip, yeah. is that, they were great. Well, I really liked it. Well, thanks for that. I mean, it's kind of on, on hiatus. I mean, as happens with a lot of these things, you know, people get into other things. Mm. You know, we, we did a we did a, an EP release and we toured with that. And it was... It was lots of fun, but it was exhausting. You know, yeah. the, you, you don't get much back from that in a tour of Ireland. You no. know, <laughs> tell and, me about and, it. it's tough. And at that point, you know, the other guys in the band weren't in the position to be able to take it out to Europe, where you know that kind of jazz funk has more of an audience. Or Japan, they love they, yeah. they love fusion in Japan. <laughs> That's well, a they place for yeah. <laughs> they um, so yeah, we ended up kind of going our separate ways. You know, we, we get together again every so often. But you know, because I, I wrote a lot of that stuff, um, I you know, I'm more inclined now to use that for my solo project, as it were. Um, uh, did I see on your website you you have like your work dis- dissident? Is that what you're calling it? Yeah. Is that the working yeah. title at the moment? Uh, well, it, it's it, yeah, it's been released. Oh, in fact, it? you know, <laughs> my usual great timing. I released it in February this year. <laughs> you know, with the plan to go tour it this summer, <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, like, there are all kinds of plans, like going out to um, Mannheim to the Guitar Summit, mm. and Frankfurt, and, and maybe even Nam to to demonstrate the bass. You know, yeah. um, for does he for have Bogart. a stall at Nam Bogart? Uh, he he didn't have one yet at now. I mean, he was looking into that, but mm. but certainly the guitar summit, you know that that was a definite. You know we've got the booking and yeah. everything, and, and I my plan was to go out there and do you know clinics and a performance and so on Brilliant. and present the album as well. You but, should do the <laughs> the London Bay show. That looks like a great weekend. I was thinking, yeah. I was, I've wanted to go, but I always end up having a gig booked on the same weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, again, then you know that that was that was in the pipeline but it's all, it's all been put off till next year now so uh, and, by and which you're, point you're going to tour probably, on your own like with a band or just well, you doing I'm, the solo thing it was going to be me and a drummer you mm. know my kind of regular collaborator Richie Dittrich kind of, oh yeah I've seen gr- him in your videos yeah, yeah. yeah he's a great young Irish drummer and uh, you know we work on a lot of stuff together so he knows the stuff already um, we work you know we, we play in a, a rock fusion rock funk kind of mm. three piece as well called uh, happy ink so you know i see a lot of them and we work well together so the plan was yeah to do a two-piece thing yeah uh, evan marion does that he tours everywhere with just the drummer and then he has a pro yeah. tools or ableton session that right, goes yeah. with them when they're playing live like you know yeah it makes a lot of sense you know because because the problem with touring is, is just getting the personnel to the venues, you know, if you've yeah. got a big band, that costs a lot, and, and accommodation costs a lot. It's you know, just two of you, it's a whole lot easier. <laughs> oh, it is. The <laughs> margins are tiny, like you know. <laughs> you might even be able to splash out and eat something that's not like pasta or something, or cooked <laughs> yeah. in the kettle in the hotel, like. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, I've done enough of the, the big band touring thing to know that. I, I, <laughs> there are easier ways to do it you know <laughs> yeah well i I wish you the best of luck i think like it, it, just keep doing what you're doing like I, I love your attitude it's just like you started doing it for yourself you're still doing it for yourself and just keep doing that and i'm sure the patreon will just keep building up and up yeah well i hope so i mean i'm very thankful for it at, at the moment you know given that uh <laughs> there's no live work so the patreon no. income is is a, is a godsend you know I'm, I'm so glad i started that early yeah it's great i have i've I've just have a few t-shirts for sale like and i'm got i'm delighted that people it's amazing when you get people buying stuff off you and giving you some money it's kind of like it's just nice isn't it like to know that people care about yeah. what you're doing enough to throw you a few bob like yeah that's right i mean with, with the internet you just get the impression that nobody's got any kind of uh, attention span Mm. And you know they'll just see something next, next, next. So, yeah. so when somebody does take the time to stop and say, "Oh, hi," <laughs> yeah. you say, "Wow," <laughs> it kind yeah. of restores your faith in humanity. You know? <laughs> it does. So there are people who actually have an attention span and are interested in stuff. <laughs> yeah, I bought a T-shirt before we came on of some random <laughs> metal band. I just like this. I love uh, the art in metal band T-shirts. I didn't uh, even yeah. barely listen to them. I was just like, 
that's cool i love that because it's band <laughs> camp um i have no commission today so yeah that, I said that's right. something. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. right well thanks a lot so um where can people check you what are your links carl uh well i guess the youtube channel is is the primary one um so youtube.com forward slash carl clues that's k-a-r-l-c-l-e-w-s i know that's difficult to i'll have them up here anyway for the, <laughs> that's great I'll put the links okay. in the description all that jazz yeah and i i have an artist page on facebook as well as my, my personal page and um and actually carlclues.com my my own website and on your there. patreon you do actually put up transcriptions if people want to if they, if they can't figure it out themselves, they get exactly. the transcriptions on your Patreon of the songs. Like. That, that's right. Yeah, for as little as a, a euro a month, you, you can basically get on there, download as many of my tra- transcriptions as you like. So, you know, you you can pay two euro and get a hundred transcriptions. Really? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's fun, it's you know, because sometimes so, you'd be thinking, what will I play on the bass at home my own? So yeah. people might really enjoy it, like <laughs> play a few tunes, <laughs> solo bass yeah. tunes. Exactly, that's it. If you can't get together with your, you know, your drummer, your guitarist, you know, but you want to hear a whole song, you want to perform a whole song, then it's a way to do it. You sure, know? you won't need them by the end of lockdown. You've done so much practice as <laughs> solo bass player. Yeah. <laughs> All right. By the way, everyone, thanks for tuning in and thanks everyone who bought the t-shirts and sure, we'll catch you at the next episode.